Phil, we welcome you up. Good morning, everybody. Well, as, uh, as uh, we were just told, this is the second of a series of four messages on the tongue twister title of Becoming God Inside Minded. The, uh, so the theme is learning to think of the, the fact that God dwells in here on the inside of me and you, but on the inside of us, rather than somewhere out there. An incredible, amazing truth. So um, that's, that's the, that slide shows you the, 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 the direction we're going. So last week was the introduction uh, message. This week which I'm talking, uh, this is going to be a fairly long message, uh, unfortunately, you have to bear with me. It's a lot of facts I've got to get through, but we're talking about what the, what the Holy Spirit uh, was doing under the Old Covenant. Uh, and, and that's a, a piece in the jigsaw that many Christians uh, miss out on. Uh, so it's important, as we see, as we'll see as we um, get to the end of, the, of, of today's message, how important that is. Uh, but if you don't understand what God was doing under the Old Covenant, you're going to misunderstand what the New Testament is all about. Um, and after we've done that, the next two messages are the bits where the rubber is really going to hit the road. So the, the two main aspects of the Holy Spirit's ministry to us today um, as intimacy with God next week and uh, being filled to overflowing uh, in the purpose of ministry, which is uh, which is the week after that, and it was good to hear from uh, from the young guys. I mean, they're you know they're only young in the faith, but they're starting to understand and experience what it means to be filled to overflowing with the power of God. So, uh, all all all, uh, all kudos to you guys, and keep keep going, and we can all keep going in that way. So, uh, as I said, there's a lot to get through today. So let's let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe you have an appointment to meet with your people today. I pray that we would have hearts open to what you want to do, that you've made that appointment with us, you've prepared us beforehand for what you intend to do, and I pray that, uh, that you might meet that appointment and show us um, what you want us to know in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this message uh, is, uh, first of all, give you a recap of what we did in the first message, which was the introduction. So, these are the truths that we needed to understand from last message. First of all, that followers of Jesus, that's you and me, assuming that you, you're a follower of Jesus like I am, but followers of Jesus have God, God himself, dwelling on the inside of them. An amazing truth, the God who created the universe out of nothing has decided to come and live on the inside. If you can understand that, then you're a smarter person than I am, because I, I, my mind gets blown apart every time I think about it. So the purpose of this gift is to make us like Jesus. And that's a piece that people often forget. They think that the purpose of the gift is for, for glory and for you know, riches and wealth and healing and all of these, things, which are great. But the ultimate purpose of the gift is to make us like Jesus. The gift is both a privilege and a responsibility. It's a privilege to experience uh, what God is doing for our own personal uh, benefit. But it's also a responsibility that we have to steward and give to others and minister uh, the, pe the presence and power of God to others uh, and affects both our relationship with God and also our relationship with others, the way we minister to people. And the Holy Spirit is not just a doctrinal truth, but is an experiential one. And so, therefore, we need to understand, to understand a healthy understanding of the, of the gift of the Holy Spirit, we need to have an, an understanding of... of, uh, of uh, of, of, of experiential truth. It's, uh, and, uh, and, and we talk quite a bit about that. You know, it's quite difficult to, to work through because your experience is going to be different to mine, but equally not all experiences are, are equally valid or equally complete. So what I said we would do is we would express the truths of the Bible in a series of what I called Holy Spirit experience principles. You'll see they're highlighted in yellow, which are broad enough that they hopefully cover your experience and my experience where they're different because we're different people, but equally they're specific enough that they don't just allow anything. So that's what we're going to do. When you see the yellow highlighting you'll see in, in the text, you'll see what I've called these principles, and, and they're the most important things we need to learn. So that was last week, or just before Easter. Let's have a look at the, this week's message now. So... We have an introduction of the idea from the Old Testament of anointing for ministry. Then we've got four chapters 
the ministry of the priests, the ministry of the judges, the ministry of the prophets, and the promise of the Messiah. So, as I said, there's quite a bit to get through. So let's first of all go on to the concept of anointing. Chapter 1. Um, the, uh, the major theme... Oh, first of all, the, the anointing for ministry, sorry. Now, not everybody received the Holy Spirit under the Old Covenant. It's not a universal gift. It was a gift that was reserved for people who were in special ministry. Right? So that's, uh, that's an important point there. Um, these people were typically inducted into their ministry by being anointed with oil. The word anoint simply means to pour oil or, or smear oil upon a person. Right? Uh, and so you can follow the, the theme of the Holy Spirit through the Old Testament, through this process of anointing, which crops up periodically. It's a bit of a strange process. Um, now, we, modern days, we talk about anointing people. You know, I think Tom mentioned that in his, uh, in his thing. We, we take a small bottle of oil and just dab it on someone's forehead. It wasn't like that in the Old Testament. They took a horn and a ram's horn, a huge thing, and basically poured it out on the person. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but the three major differences compared to the gift you and I have received, and we need to bear this in mind, is that their gift was temporary for a special purpose, whereas the gift that we receive under the new covenant is permanent. So theirs was external only. There was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit, whereas for us it's both external and internal. And the third difference is that theirs was conditional Ours was unconditional. By conditional, I mean that it was possible to lose that by sin. So if you know your Old Testament story, you'll remember the story of Samson, that mighty man of strength who, uh, who disobeyed God one time too many and the Holy Spirit left him and he uh, suffered judgment. Also, you can think of, uh, of King Saul, who uh, said we read about in, in, there in, uh, in uh, 1 Samuel 16 that... Um, that when he disobeyed God, it said uh, the Holy Spirit left Saul and an evil spirit came and took its place, uh, which is not a very nice, uh, nice thing to have happen. But interestingly, when David sinned with Bathsheba, he didn't lose the Holy Spirit. So it's not an absolute thing. It didn't happen every time you sin. It's not, so, it's not a case of one sin in your hand. In fact, you read in Psalm 51, David pleaded with God when he, after his sin. He said, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Um, and God answered that prayer. So, you know, God looks at the heart and looks at the motivations and all of that sort of thing. But basically under the old covenant, there was, it was conditional. Now, anointing. As I said, the way it worked in the old covenant was that, uh, generally speaking, someone who was to be inducted into this ministry was anointed by having not just a little smattering of oil put upon them, but being anointed by a whole ram's horn worth of oil. So we're going to illustrate that point now with, um, I'll, I'll, need, I'll need a volunteer. We've got a volunteer who's, who, who doesn't mind getting messy. Uh, Tom, yeah, Tom, I think Tom, Tom's a good worker. Okay. Um, yeah, um, to help with this, I have one two-litre two litre bottle of cooking oil. Yeah. Now, what I want you to do, Tom, is I want you to take the lid off that, all right, and anoint me with the whole bottle. Come on, let me do it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay. I suppose it wouldn't do the electronics much good either, would it? No, no, no. Why not? I'll pay no. for it. I'll pay for it. Okay, I think we're going to, we're going to listen to your mum. No. Anyway, so, so put, make sure, no, put the lid back on. Put the lid on. We'll, we'll have to simulate. We'll have to pretend, okay. So now it's going to take a while to pour that much oil over me, but I want you to anoint me with oil, the whole bottle. Okay, you ready? You can say, oh, I can feel that. Oh, yes. Oh, look at that stuff. It's going in my eyes. Oh, all over my arm. Oh, down onto my body. Oh, I tell you what, I hope no one here smokes. If so, if so you better... Better keep away from me because if for lunch we'll be having fried fillet of fill, I reckon, or sizzling sot, sizzling sot steaks. Oh. I, think, I think it might be empty. 
If you got okay, so now see the pile of oil down here? It's all over my arms, all over my body, my clothes. I mean, the dry cleaning bill is going to be horrendous. Okay, give us a hug, mate. Oh, no, I'm covered in oil. <laughs> no. Anyone else want a hug? Handshake, maybe? Okay. Okay, enough, enough messing around. The, point of the main point of, what I, of that little exercise is uh, that point at the end that uh, Tom said. Because I've been anointed with oil, anyone who touches me, what happens to them? They get messed around as well with oil, right? It's an external thing, right? The oil is upon me, and the purpose of the oil being on me is not to bless me, but to bless others, so that if you happen to come in contact with me, you come in contact with the Holy Spirit yourself. There's a wonderful, strange story in the Old Testament of the prophet Elijah, who, as you probably know, performed many signs and wonders, had a quite miraculous ministry. But the, the, the story says that when he died, they buried him in a, in, a, in a cave. But at the time, there were raiders from overseas coming into the territory, so they didn't have time to complete the funeral service properly, and they didn't close the, the tomb. And so some time afterwards, there was this open tomb and they went to bury someone else in this tomb because presumably they didn't realise that there was already a dead body in this tomb. So they took this dead guy and they went into the tomb and they threw his body into the grave that Elisha happened to be buried in. And the account says that as soon as the man's body touched the bones of Elisha, he was raised from the dead. He jumped up and, and, and became alive. So you can see what, what's happening here in this story, strange story, but what it says, see, Elisha was such a man of God that the anointing of the Holy Spirit was still upon his body even after he died. It wasn't dependent upon him being there in a, in a, as a living human being. It was just resting physically on his flesh. And so this dead body touches him and poof, comes back to life. That's the power of the anointing. So that's the introduction. If you understand the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant, you've got to understand this concept of the anointing, this external presence of the, of the Holy Spirit, which is there to minister to others. It's not there for your benefit, it's there for the benefit of others. Okay, let's move on. Chapter 1, the ministry of the priest. So the first time that we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, and these, these chapters are basically consecutive, but they're not completely. There's some over, over, overflow, but there's, there's a logical progression. So if I say, talk to you about the book of Exodus, the chances are that if you've probably uh, got a lot of your knowledge from uh, movies and things like that, you think of the main event, main theme of the book of Exodus, you think of as being the Passover and the, the miracles in Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea and all of that sort of stuff, which is great. They are important events. But from a literary point of view, the main theme of Exodus is not those events. You know what the main theme of the book of Exodus is? It's the presence of God. God comes down to his people and wants to presence himself with his people. Now, plan A for God was that everybody in his people, in the people of Israel, would have intimate experience of him. It says in Exodus 19, verse 6, that his purpose was, that's just before the Ten Commandments were given, it said, that he says, he said, I want you to be a kingdom of priests. That's what I want you to be. Every one of you is to be a priest, because the ministry of a priest is all about ministering the presence of God. The sacrifices are important, but only in the sense that sacrifices are needed so that un impure people like you and me can actually come into the presence of God. So the idea is that the sacrifices cleanse the person so that they're able to come into God's presence. So God's purpose uh, was that he wanted, first his plan A was that everybody would have that relationship with God. And then they go to, go to Exodus 20 and you have the Ten Commandments and God actually spoke in an audible voice to all of the people. 
But the people were basically scared off by this. They didn't like the idea of God speaking to them in an audible voice, so they said, go away. We don't want to hear from God. It's making us terrified. And I tell you what, if you've ever heard God speak to you in that sort of way, it's a terrifying experience, right? The people were terrified. So they said, hey, God, we want God to speak to Moses, and then Moses, you can come and tell us what God's saying. They wanted an, an indirect relationship. So God moved over from there onto plan B. Uh, and plan B was for this thing. This thing which you uh, may recognise, this is a, it's actually a working model that exists in the, in the state of Israel today. This is the tabernacle, uh, which was a place where people met with God. Strange looking building. Uh, it was also called the tent of meeting. Wouldn't it be a glorious, wonderful thing, you know, if our churches were called the place of meeting? Not meeting where you and I meet together, but where people actually meet with God. Now, you can see that the design of this uh, structure was that there was this outer area, outer court, and then the covered bit that looks like a large sleeping tent um, contained two rooms. Uh, the first place was the holy place, and the second place, the inner room, was the most holy place. And basically, what these talked about was that there was a progression of ways in which people could come into meeting with God. So all the Israelites could go into that outer court. So as so long as you were part of God's people, you could come to that level of relationship with God, level of intimacy with God, where you could go into the outer courts. But inside the, te inside the tent of meeting inside itself, uh, in the holy place, um, now, in, sorry, um, you can see there's two bits of furniture there in the, in the outer court. There's, uh, there's the altar for sacrifices, and there's the washing basin. Right? So that's where the, the sacrifices were carried out, right? Uh, they were sacrificed on the altar and the priest would then wash on the basin, right? And then the priest, having made the sacrifice, would then move into the tent. So the second level was the holy place, which was open to priests only. Uh, and that was direct connection with God through consecration, right? So it was the next step up. But the highest level, the place where God himself dwelled, was the so-called holy of holies on the inside, where only the high priest was able to enter, and that was only once a year. And it was such a fearsome thing that he was, a uh, cord was attached to him with bells ringing, so that if he happened to be struck dead while he was in there, and the, and the bell stopped ringing, they could drag him out. That's how fearsome the, the experience was. But uh, when this ministry was set up, God confirmed his pleasure with it by manifesting his Shekinah glory so that the people, not even Moses, could stand in his presence. Right? So if we go on to the slide, but what we learn from chapter 1, the next slide, the key Holy Spirit principles from this period of time with the priests. Let's have a look at them, okay? First of all... God wants to have intimate relations, relationship with all of his people. That means you and me. As long as you're part of God's family, God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. Second point is that the barrier to this is not with God, but with us. Our sense of guilt and shame caused by sin. The reference there to Genesis 3 is, of course, the, relation, the reference to Adam and Eve, straight after they sinned in the Garden of Eden, it said God was walking through the garden, and they hid. God didn't want them to hide. They hid from God. Their sense of guilt and shame hid them from God. Right? So that's what stops us from moving in deeper to God. Right? The third thing is that there are deeper, different levels of intimacy that we need to move through as we enter into God's presence. Right? So there's... A, a, a degree of intimacy that we all have, which is like indirect and you know, in the outer courts, then we can move by consecration into the inner court. But the deepest level is for God to act, wants us to actually move into his intimate presence and enjoy that close, intimate fellowship in the Holy, holy of Holies. But the ultimate manifestation of God's presence is so glorious that we cannot yet stand it. 
So there's a process, a lifelong, eternity-long process of moving into the presence of God and enjoying his presence. Okay, we're traveling okay so far? Right, next point, chapter 2. Now, the problem was, of course, that the priests uh, did not follow God completely, and, and though they were supposed to minister the presence of God, it ended up devolving into just religious rituals. After they moved into the Promised Land, we get to the book of Judges, and we're told about in there the uh, rather nasty stories about how, how, they, uh, how they were behaving and the, the, the sort of things they were doing. And basically the story says that um, as the people disobeyed, God gave them over to, uh, to the power of their enemies. And what they needed was for someone to come and save them. Now, we think of the word save, I'll just put this in at this moment, we tend to think of the word save as being a particularly religious word. You know, have you been saved, brother? I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And that's all true. I mean, uh, you know, there is a, a, a spiritual sense in which salvation is about being saved from sin, and that obviously is the, the deepest level of salvation that we need. But at its basic level, salvation is very simple. It means being rescued from a peril. So in the Old Covenant, the major peril that people experienced was oppression from their enemies. They were surrounded by hostile uh, countries, and every time they disobeyed God, God gave them over to the consequences of that, which meant that basically they were oppressed, and they needed to be saved. And so Judges 3.10 is the first time we see this, but it was a typical form that happened. We read that the Spirit of the Lord came upon someone, in this case it was Othniel, so that he became Israel's judge. Now, note the form of words there. The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, came upon the man, so outside, right, external, and he became a judge. Now, a judge was like a leader. Um, it was the, 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 the forerunner of the king. Uh, it was a, basically, it was a non-hereditary king. The, the, the requirement for being the judge was this anointing of the Holy Spirit rather than the fact that they were the son or the grandson of the previous king. Now, the key concept here we need to understand is the Spirit of God coming upon a person, which the concept is what I, uh, is, is what the Bible calls is the concept of inspiration. Now, inspiration is quite a strange, uh, and until you've experienced it for yourself, it's a difficult thing to explain. It's like a human divine partnership where the human does the work, but God provides the empowering, right? So when you're inspired, um, what you're doing is ostensibly you. You don't lose control of your own ability. You're, you're ministering out of your own uh, knowledge, your own abilities, your own humanity, but God comes on you with a sense of power. It's like a glove that fits neatly on the hand, um, there's a beautiful example I remember I saw when uh, years ago when I saw a mother had her little 12-month-old baby sitting in the high chair. And uh, obviously when a baby is sitting in a high chair, um, the baby makes quite a bit of mess. And the mother had this interesting way of dealing with that mess. So she said, she said, she taught the baby this, she said, does the baby want to clean up the high chair? And the baby said, yes, yes, yes. So the mother gave the baby the cloth, the cleaning cloth. And as the baby started to move the cloth randomly across the high chair, the mother gently put her hand on the baby and directed where it would go. So from the baby's point of view, right, thinking as, as the baby, the baby was cleaning the chair. But everybody else knows that it wasn't really the baby that was cleaning because the baby doesn't have the power to clean the high chair, right? The mother was deliberately partnering with her baby in order to teach it how to do this sort of thing. Right? And that's the way it is with the anointing. The most famous example of um, the anointing, uh, the most famous example of, of this that we know of is the story of David and Goliath. You know the story how David, uh, how the, the Philistines put up their mighty warrior, you know, 10-foot-tall man, Goliath, 
and who insulted God, David, thought the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to not gonna let this man do it. And he, he grabbed you know, five stones, rushes up to him with his sling and whoosh, buries, this, buries a stone in his forehead. The guy drops down dead and he wins the day. Now, everything that happened ostensibly could have been natural. Didn't have to, there was no obvious evidence of God being involved. I mean, you know, it was the rock that did the killing. It was David who had experience in slingshot and his aim. But there were obviously so many things that could have gone wrong. I mean, the, David had no protection, no armour. Um, he might have missed with his shot. The guy might have ducked or, or moved his head out of the way. Even if it hit him, it might have been a glancing blow. I mean, there's so many things that could have gone wrong. What, what was the miracle was the way it worked because God was actually directing the, the, the process. Interesting, I can tell a, a story in my own experience happened to me about 20 years ago in the most unusual circumstances. Um, my David and Goliath experience. Um, as many of you know, I work as a consultant in the financial services industry. I'm, a, I'm an actuary. And my competitors are often big multinational corporations, as in multi-billion dollar corporations. So me, David and Goliath up there. Now, on this particular occasion, we've been working on the year-end accounts, audit, what they call auditing the year-end accounts for, this, for the client. And something had gone wrong. It was the day before the results were due to be published. And, normally, and on that day, you normally go to the board and it should just be a sign-off day where everyone says, yes, we're happy with the results. We sign them off and authorise them to be published. But on this occasion, the... Uh, the accounting auditors, the, the Goliath in this case, had discovered a problem with the accounts, a $5 million problem. Uh, and they were quite negligent because they should have found this out way earlier. You, you know, you're not supposed to bring these things in at the last minute. And, um, and uh, they called this board meeting. And because the problem was that this $5 million problem was not only going to affect, it was not something that was going to be easy to fix. It was going to affect lots of other numbers. There was at least a week's worth of work just to sort out the mess. So the board was not exactly very happy. And so they called an emergency board meeting to discuss it, and I was invited purely as a spectator. You know, and I mean, you understand in these situations, it's basically you only speak if you're spoken to. You know, wear a, wear a nice suit, wash behind your ears, and only speak if you're spoken to. You know, that's the sort of situation. So I'm in there with that spirit, and they're talking about this problem. And suddenly I feel the Spirit of God come upon me. And I could see the answer to the problem. Now, as I said, it was, it was within my area of professional knowledge. It wasn't, as if, it wasn't as if, say, you were in that situation where you didn't know anything about actuarial science. It wasn't miraculous knowledge. It was just within my area of professional um, expertise. And I saw a simple solution. So I spoke up and I said, excuse me, can I speak? And they said, sure. And I went up to the, the whiteboard and spent five minutes drawing my solution on the board. And I said, if you do it this way, then you can solve the problem quickly and we can solve it within half an hour. And the chairman of the board looked at everybody else and said, does that work? And the accounting auditor said, yes. And the chief financial officer said, yes. And they said, OK, thank you very much. Let's go and do that. Come back in an hour, go and do it and come back in an hour with the, with the new numbers and, and we'll sign them off. And so we went and did that. And I was rather confused about all of this because, as I said, it felt to me like the Holy Spirit had come upon me in this anointing sense that I'd experienced on occasions in a spiritual context. But this, here's one happening in my professional life. What's going on here? I was, I was confused. Well, my confusion was explained a short time later when the chief financial officer of the client came to me and said, Phil, he says, that was amazing, he said, but you don't understand the full, so full story. I said, well, what, what is the full story, he said. He said, that accounting auditor, right, the one who caused this mess, he's gunning for your job. He's been behind your back. He's been going to the company and saying that you're no good at your job and that it, it would be much better for the client if we were to take on that job ourselves. Right? So this is the guy who had no solution to the problem, 
And when the Spirit of God came upon me, we solved the problem in five minutes. That guy lost his job. The chairman of the board called him in and gave him a right talking to and basically requested his, uh, his company to remove him from that job for the next year. So that's just an example. I had no idea what was going on, and, you know, and it's an unusual set of circumstances, but God comes upon you in that way as, uh, of anointing. Now, we have a look at this scripture. Let's have a look at a particular example here. Uh, uh, so the Spirit of the Lord came upon often, who would have read that one. Let's look at 1 Samuel 10. This is the, t- uh, the time when, the, when the, they moved into the period of the kings. So in this passage, the prophet Samuel is anointing Saul to be the first king. And so we read, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil. Here's our flask of olive oil. All right poured it on Saul's head, as we tried to do, and were stopped from doing, kissed him, saying, has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? There then followed a series of four verses where you know, he gave in certain particular instructions, which we don't need to worry about. But then he said, after that, after doing these instructions, you will go to Gibeah of God, where there is a Philistine outpost. As you approach the town you will meet a procession of prophets coming down from the high place with lyres, tambourines, pipes and harps being played before them, and they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Now, a couple of points to make here. If you look at the context, this prophesying that these prophets were doing was of the inspirational kind. Right? So prophecy can be either inspirational, which is where um, you just feel a sense that God wants you to speak and you open your mouth and as you speak, the words come. Right? That's inspirational prophecy. There's also revelational prophecy, which is where God puts a word or a vision in your mind and having put it in your mind, you then speak it out. This was the inspirational kind, right? Where they, they, uh, they were doing that. And, and the, so the, Saul was told that you will meet these prophets with inspired speech. And from that, you will become an inspired person. And from then on, whatever you see in your hand to do, that is God with you. Okay, so you see the picture? Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll see exactly what happened in the middle, straight after this event. The very next story in chapter 11 says this, Now Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said to him, Make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I'll make a treaty with you on only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you, and so bring disgrace on all Israel. I probably wouldn't be thinking about the disgrace of all Israel if they were promising to gouge out my right eye, but that's probably a sign of the time. Anyway, the elders of Jabesh said to him, give us seven days so that we can send messengers throughout Israel, and if no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. Not much else they could do. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then, Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen, And he asked, what is wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? Then they repeat to him what the men of Jabesh had said. Right? So here's the situation where the people needed saving from an enemy. And here we see what happened. When Saul heard these words, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces and sent the pieces by messenger throughout Israel proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people and they came out together as one. And the story then goes on to talk about how uh, with this uh, newly formed ragtag army that, uh, that Saul had managed to put together through this anointing that was upon him, they were able to defeat Nahash and the Ammonites. So you see what's happening there, that, that uh, Saul, the Spirit of God came upon Saul and empowered him. So none of those things um, 
uh, couldn't be done in the natural, but it was the fact that the anointing of God was on which actually made it all fit together nicely. So we've spent a lot of time on this, but it's, it's something that is not so easy to understand. But let's finish up that, that chapter two at that point. Um, key experience principles from chapter two. First of all, God wants to empower his people to deliver them from their enemies through a partnership process called inspiration. And the concept is of the Holy Spirit coming upon the person like a supernatural garment. The key outcome is for supernatural deeds, that is works of power, but this is sometimes, as it was in the case of Saul, sometimes preceded by supernatural words, in this case prophecy. Okay, so that's chapter two, the ministry of the judges and the kings. Well, sadly, after a good start, the kingdom uh, went downhill because the, kings became, the kingdom became hereditary. It was no longer uh, defi- defended, defined by, um, by whether the people had the Holy Spirit resting upon them. It became a, a normal hereditary monarchy. And as a result, they drifted back into disobedience. So God tried chapter three, which was to raise up people who had anointing of revelation. So we see the key words there, 1 Kings 17 verse 2, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of the first, but not, certainly not the first, but one of the, uh, uh, the, the, the obvious examples of a prophet where, where the word of the Lord came to him and he spoke the words of revelation that God had. Now, revelation means revealing God. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that prophecy is not really about telling the future, nor, interestingly enough, is it about giving new laws. Right? The prophet's main role was to bring to life the laws that they already had right, and remind them of what the context of those laws was in their thing. So those of you who have read part of my uh, read, my, read my book, you'll see that we talk about the prophet, prophet Jeremiah in the early chapters. Um, everything that he's saying can be traced back to the Torah. It wasn't as if he was bringing totally new revelation to the people. He was bringing to life what God had already spoken and that they had forgotten. Right? So the role of the Spirit was to bring to life what was uh, what had already been given, and to make it relevant, bring it alive to the people. Now, various uh, methods were used to convey the word of God, poetry and prose, song, visions, dreams, uh, acting out the message like we did earlier with, with uh, me and Tom. All of these things were me- methods used by the prophets to get their message across. The word of God is powerful Uh, But the power is ineffective unless it is brought to life by the Spirit. Now, we'll talk about this more next week when we talk about uh, intimate relationship with God, intimacy. But the word is still true, right? Uh, But it's not effective unless uh, unless it is brought to life by the Spirit. The role of the prophet is to bring the message alive through the power of the Spirit. So let's have a look at the experience principles here. So key experience principles from chapter 3. God wants his people to hear his words and get to know who he is. That is the process of called revelation. So chapter 2 was about inspiration. Right? Chapter 3 is about revelation. The concept is of the spirit putting his words in the mind of the prophet who then speaks them out faithfully. The key outcome for the people uh, was for the people to know what God's requirements are in their current circumstances. How they responded to that was up to them. The prophet was, uh, was, had to be a fairly hardy soul to be a prophet. Uh, people generally didn't believe what you, what you said, but that wasn't the prophet's problem. No, the prophet's responsibility was to tell people faithfully what God said. If the people chose to disobey, that was their problem. Ezekiel 3 explains that, that boundary quite clearly. Okay. So that's a summary of the way the Holy Spirit moved 
in the Old Covenant, but there's one chapter more we need to explain, which I hopefully, when you understand this, you'll understand why, where we're going with this over the next two weeks. So let's talk about the promise of the Messiah. So none of these ministries in the Old Covenant, the priests, the kings or, or judges, and the prophets, they were all Band-Aid solutions. They never solved the real problem, right? They all died out uh, a natural death, shall we say, um, because of the problem with the people was that they, there was sin in their life, right? And an external solution was never going to solve the problem. So God forced, promised the day we were coming when he would put his spirit on the inside of people so that the real problem, the problem of sin, could be dealt with and so that people could become, change people on the inside so that they would become the sort of people who could actually uh, move in the way and experience God in an effective and powerful way. At each of these stages, in the age of the, the priests, the, the kings and the prophets, God actually promised uh, in the days when these uh, ministries were failing, he promised that the day would come when he would solve this problem. He talked about a person coming who would bear a full anointing and would fulfill the, 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 the defects in the first. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see. So God promised one day to send a man who would be known as the anointed one. Remember the story of the anointing, right? He would be the anointed man. The word anointed in Hebrew is, is the word Messiah. So that's where we get the word Messiah from, or the Christ. So God promised one day to send a man known as the anointed one who would fulfill all the old covenant roles. So, for example, in Psalm 110, we're told that he will be a priest, but not of the order of Levi, of the order of Melchizedek, who was an earlier order of priests. Psalm 110, verses 1 to 4. But in the time of the kings, uh, he promised that uh, although the kingdom failed, uh, he, would, he would send a son of David who would be known as God's son. First Chronicles 17, the promise uh, that, uh, that, that this Messiah would be the son of God and son and heir of David, right? the king, son of David. And he also promised that uh, in Deuteronomy 18 that this Messiah would be a prophet like Moses, so he would bring revelation of God into people's lives in a powerful new way. So this Messiah would fulfill the role, all the roles of the Old Testament. He would fulfill the priest, the kings, and the prophets. But not only would he possess the anointing of the Spirit without measure, he would also pass that onto his followers. And this is where you and I come in, because what are we? We are followers. So not only would he possess the anointing of the Spirit without measure, he would also pass on to his followers so that they would become a nation of priests, kings, and prophets. That's the purpose of that prom promise in Joel chapter 2, where it says, In the last days I will pour up my Spirit on all flesh, even your sons and daughters, they will all prophesy. Right? That's the purpose of that verse. That the purpose of the Messiah is to anoint Everyone, because having dealt with the problem of sin through sacrifice of, his, of himself, right, he would then inaugurate this new era of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the reign of the Spirit. And this era would be known as the kingdom of God. It would be the era when God's righteousness covered the earth as the waters cover the sea, and it would be known as the kingdom of God. Now... For the finale, we're now in a position to understand a text in the New Testament that people who don't understand the Old Testament tend to skip over. It's, there's not many stories in the, old, in, the old, in the New Testament that are mentioned in all four Gospels, right? The crucifixion is there, um, but not much else. Um, each of the New Testament authors has their own perspective on what's important. Right? Even the birth of Jesus is only mentioned by two of the four gospel writers. But this story 
is so fundamentally important that it's mentioned by all four, um, all four gospel writers. And I'm going to quote the version from Matthew, because Matthew was writing for a Jewish audience and therefore writing to people who would understand the Old Testament better and understand his, his thing. So we're, we're reading from Matthew chapter 3, and we hear that it starts with John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was ministering, and he says to the people, I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I am, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and it will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barns and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee into the Jordan to be baptised by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you. And you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfil all righteousness. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And then a few verses later, we read that from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, if you compare this with what I just said a few seconds ago on the previous slide, hopefully you can see the theme that's going on here. Jesus is being portrayed as this Old Testament Messiah, this anointed one. Right? Holy Spirit, he goes to this place where he gets anointed into his ministry by John. John can't understand why. He knows that Jesus is a righteous man. He said, I need your baptism, Jesus. You don't need mine. Jesus said, no, this is the way it's got to happen so that righteousness is fulfilled. Remember righteousness, the key to the kingdom? Right? This was the key to righteousness happening. Right? We see the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus in power and staying upon him, permanently anointing him. Right? We see the, the voice of God saying, this is my son, the son being the son of David, the anointed one, the promised one. Right? This is all fulfilling the Old Testament promises. And finally, we see that having received this anointing, Jesus understands what's going on as well. He goes out to preach. What's his message? The kingdom of God has arrived. You better be ready, repent, Step in, because the kingdom of God has come. The new era has arrived. So let's finish now. What are we saying? Summary of the message. The key Holy Spirit principles from the old covenant. Now you can see now why it's necessary for us to go through this Old Testament, because we are now living in the days of fulfilment. What is happening to us and has been happening for the last 2,000 years, according to the New Testament, is a fulfilment of everything that was promised, everything that happened under the Old Covenant and was promised to be fulfilled under Jesus. So if you look at the next slide, we are living in the days of the fulfilment of all the Old Testament promises. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? We are living in times of fulfilment. All of these things that we've read about, they are the things that belong to us now. The fulfilment of the ages has come upon us. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. As followers of Jesus, we are the inheritors of his threefold anointing of priests, kings, and prophets. Right? That's who we are. That's who God sees us. That's why the Holy Spirit has come on the inside of us. As priests, we are to experience and manifest to others the presence of God. That's our role. That's our ministry. That's our mantle. As judges or kings, our role is to speak spirit-inspired words and speak and perform spirit-empowered deeds to deliver people from all manner of oppression. That's our role. That's what we're here for. Right? As prophets, 
Our role is to speak God's living word and to bring revelation of who God is to ourselves and others. Now, each one of us is not going to do all of these things perfectly. Right? But collectively, the church is meant to do that. That's why Jesus says that it is for our good that he goes away because when he goes away, the Holy Spirit comes and what he was just doing on an individual level, we, the church, would be doing uh, collectively. Our witness to the gospel takes place as we collectively fulfil these roles to the glory of God. In the book of Acts where it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. It's not actually saying that you will go and do witnessing. Witnessing is not going out and doing various things, right? Telling people about Jesus. That's important, but it's not what witnessing is all about. We are a witness. The witness is that we are living in the days of fulfilment and we are living out the life of Jesus. We are living the anointing of Elijah and Elisha. We are living the anointing of Moses. We are living the anointing of Elijah and Jeremiah and all of the Old Testament prophets. They are our role models of how we should be behaving. Now, I don't need to tell you that for the most part of the last 2,000 years, the church has fallen well short of this New Testament standard. Even today, we still fall way short. I mean, even the best of us, um, very inadequate. But, you know, there's grace. There's grace to make it happen. What we need to do is understand the vision of what God is saying. Uh, I think that's the last slide, isn't it? That's what is our heritage as children of God. That's what God is wanting to do in our lives. It is so much way more grandiose than you and I could ever imagine. And God wants to do it. God's not going to take you right to the end in one step. It's sufficient that we just go one step at a time. I've been walking this walk for 40 years and I've still got as far to go, I think, as when I first started. But at least I know that. At least I know that. And we have the following thousands of years in glory to experience, but it starts today. Next week, next two weeks, we'll talk about the two aspects of this, which are the easiest way of, of, of breaking it down. Intimacy with God, which is the, the internal relationship with me with God, right? uh, how that is a, the powerhouse of our life. And the second week is ministry to others, so the outpouring of power. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have met with us in your grace. We thank you that you've met with us by appointment. Give us a vision, Lord, of what you want us to do. Give us each a vision of the next step in the process for us that is immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Uh, But you are with us and you want us to move forward. In Jesus' name, amen.